In this episode, we're going to hear three very weird and strange encounters. But before we get to the stories, I want to mention there are two new channels of mine that you should definitely check out. The first is Donovan Dread 2, where I release the same great content, just a little shorter in length. Then there's Dread Captures, where we analyze various encounters that were captured on video, that were sent in to us, or that are available online. So if you're digging my content, make sure to hit that subscribe button, and I'll keep narrating these creepy encounters. Now let's get to the stories. I'm not a professional fisherman, but I'd like to think of myself as a pro, because I take it very seriously, and I do it every chance I get. Let's just say I go fishing any time I'm not at my day job. In a similar fashion, I have fished in many places, but my favorite places to fish are rivers and lakes, and in my state, that usually means going to the mountains. I'm very good at what I do. I never come home without some fresh trout in my hand. So when I returned from this particular trip without any fish, my wife was very confused as to why. I've never experienced anything like this before, and I've been to the mountains countless times. I know the wildlife. I know the layout of the land. But what I saw on that trip made me fearful to ever return. It was getting close to late fall, early winter, when I decided to take a few days trip up into the mountains. It's really my last hurrah for the year. I wanted to stock up for the winter. I took four days off, but I only planned to be gone for two. I love being outdoors, but not when it's frigid, so I wanted to come back home in decent weather. I packed up my things and said my farewells, and I started driving towards my favorite fishing spot. The wind was pretty cold, but the sun was out and shining, and the sky seemed pretty clear. Getting to my favorite fishing area was a bit of work, because it's not easy to find unless you know where you're going. It's not much of a fork in the road, but it looks like it if you look hard enough. And I always take the less driven path to the left, the way you can't easily spot. I don't really take people to this spot. It was a secret fishing area that my dad would take me to, and I like to keep it private. Anyways, I take the left path on the fork in the road. And I drive a ways until I see a small clearing and the river. I unload all my things, including my tent. I get my hooks in the water as quickly as I can. Being up there usually gives me time to avoid thinking too much. I usually watch the ripples in the water, or I watch the sky change colors. I hadn't gotten a bite by the time the sky started changing pink. I was growing a little frustrated, but I knew I'd have the next day. Especially that early morning to catch something. I caught myself really looking at the trees for the rest of my time. They just looked really nice in the lighting. I'm kind of mad I hadn't really noticed them before. So anyways, I'm looking at the trees across the river from me. There's plenty of them to hide something like a deer or what have you. But the trees weren't very tall, especially not by the riverbed. A lot of the trees had burnt down a few years prior, so there were areas that seemed to be a little more bare than nature intended. It seems like I'm babbling, but a lot of this is really important for you to understand. You see, I'm as skeptical about things as anyone, but what I saw wasn't a deer or a bear. As I'm looking out towards the trees across the river, I can see between the trees, especially towards the tops of the smaller trees closest to me. But going back, it seemed to get more dense, and then a little beyond that, it was sparse again. There were holes, you know, gaps between the dense trees. Anyways, I'm looking out and I see something that looks low to the ground. It's in the sparse area several feet from the river. But, there's a lot more trees in front of it than I realize. At first, I thought I'm looking at a bear cub. Something small and dark. Much darker than a deer. And it's not really moving. So that seemed odd. I'm not a scientist, but I do know that bears don't really sit idle. They move. Especially little clubs. They've got places to be. So the longer I'm looking at this dark, hairy mass the more I'm starting to wonder what it's doing. I notice my fishing pole starts to rattle a little, so I reach my hand out to grab it. As soon as I do this movement, I notice the dark thing moves, so my reflexes cause me to look back up towards it. The thing was much closer now, standing in front of the dense area that was hiding it before. As I said, 
The trees in front of the dense area were pretty short, so when this thing moved forward, I could see that it was much larger than I thought. It seemed to be standing on its hind legs, but it was crouching down to meet the tops of smaller trees. The only reason I know this is because I could see what appeared to be fingers wrapping over the tops of its knees. Aspen trees don't have much to them, especially not near the base. So even though the thing thought it was hiding, I could see lots more of it than it must have thought. What really freaked me out were the eyes looking at me from atop of that small tree. They were dark, just like the hair on it, but they seemed much more deep, like they were curious. It didn't seem threatening at first, so I tried to walk closer to the river without looking away. But as soon as I stepped closer, it stood straight up, and disappeared back into the dense trees behind it. That thing towered over the juvenile aspen. If I had to guess, I'd say the aspen was around four or five feet tall, and this thing was nearly twice its size. But it glides into the trees with ease, like it was used to be hidden away, despite how big it was. I know it sounds crazy, but whatever it was looked more human than a beast, especially in those eyes. And with that, I decided to pack up all my things and go back home. I didn't even spend the two days that I had planned. Greetings, Donovan. I love your channel. It's always given me a thrill hearing about the scary happenings people have experienced in the secluded parts of the world. I can't say I ever expected to have one of those experiences myself, but I did. I live in the heart of Philadelphia, a few blocks north of the center city, just before it starts to get too sketchy. It's always busy and always crowded, so I never expected to come across anything like what I've seen in your videos. It all happened on what was easily the worst day of my life. I've had some issues with drinking throughout my life, and I'm proud to say that I've been three years sober. This past February, I almost poured it all down the drain. I was in Fairmont near where my girlfriend and our son live with her parents. Both her mom and dad are lawyers that work for a law firm that defends other lawyers. So they live in a real nice townhouse on North Woodstock Street, right behind the Eastern State Penitentiary. If you're not a Philly native, you've probably still heard of the old prison. It was once the most expensive prison in the world and held notorious criminals like Al Capone, but is now just a historic landmark most famous for being an elaborate haunted house around Halloween. I didn't live with my girl and son because we couldn't all fit in my tiny apartment, and her parents were not a big fan of mine. It sucked, but the schools around her parents' neighborhood were fantastic, and I wanted to give my son the best chance he could at not being a screw-up like me. Me and my girl were having a knockdown dragout drag-out fight that night, and we broke up. I was in a bad place. I stormed out of the house and walked down Fairmont Avenue looking for a place to drink. Sobriety didn't matter to me anymore. It was still too early for most of the bars to be open, and I wanted to get a whole bottle to myself anyways. So, I headed to the nearest store. Unfortunately at the time, but fortunately for me in the long run, the closest store was not open. I was beyond annoyed, so I kept my eyes peeled for a bus station so I could leave the neighborhood. I found one at the end of the street and waited impatiently in the cold. I was still simmering from my fight with Michelle, so I really didn't care anymore where I went. I was intent on jumping the first bus that came by and getting away from the area. A SEPTA bus finally came rolling down the street, but the LCD display board on the front of the bus was blank. It didn't show any destination. Normally they say off-duty if they're not on route, so I assumed it was just busted. It rumbled to a stop at the bus stop. I walked towards the door, but the unmarked bus started to speed off. I was pissed and chased it down the street. I picked up cans and gravel off the street and threw them at the back of the bus. After about a half a block, the bus stopped, and the door opened. I was surprised. I didn't expect it to stop after the hissy fit I just threw, and I wasn't sure if I should actually get on. My anger from the fight with Michelle overtook my caution and I walked onto the bus. I tried to pay, but the driver just smiled and jerked his thumb to the back, indicating for me to take a seat. By all accounts, the bus looked normal, 
but everything was off. It was all so indistinct. I still can't picture the face of the driver. I couldn't tell you his hair color or really anything. I sat near the back of the bus. There weren't many people in the bus, but everyone I passed looked just as miserable as I did. Like this bus was a vehicle for people at their lowest point. I didn't see a single smiling face on the entire bus. We rode for hours, passing indistinct neighborhoods. It all looked familiar, but I couldn't place any local landmarks. It felt like I was touring a movie set built to look like Philadelphia, but wasn't the actual city. I felt an overwhelming sense of lethargy. I wasn't even bothered about where we were going. Occasionally we would stop, and someone would just stand up and get off. The people getting off looked surprised to be leaving. These looked like random spots, but those exiting the bus clearly knew their surroundings. As we drove, I replayed the argument I had with Michelle over and over again in my mind, realizing what I should have said or shouldn't have said. Maybe I had been too harsh and defensive. Maybe I need to be more understanding. We only picked up one person while I was on the bus. It played out very closely to how I got on. The bus stopped and then sped off, leaving the poor soul to chase us down the street. What really struck me, though, was how he seemed to be the only one in the crowd to notice us. There were other people at that bus stop, but they didn't seem to notice us rolling in. Hours or days later, I honestly couldn't even tell you. I had an epiphany. It was a crystallizing moment of clarity, where I knew exactly what I had to do. Just as the thought burst into my mind, the bus stopped. I looked out my window and realized we were back on Fairmont. The look of surprise on the other passengers' faces, just before they got off the bus, suddenly made sense to me. I ran off that bus and knocked on the door to my girlfriend's place. She ripped the door open instantly, like she had been standing right at the doorway. Her clothes were the same as when I left her, and everything looked exactly as it had when I left. I told her everything that went through my head on that strange bus, and we're still together to this day. I don't understand what happened, but I know it somehow gave me a second chance. I never did believe in the supernatural. Truthfully, I still don't. Maybe that's why it's so hard for me to square away what I saw in 06. It's like a black stain on my perfect portrait of faith. It's something I can't explain. I hope that you can. If not, maybe you can point me towards someone with a theory. All of my theories have run their course. Do you remember 06? An ice storm came through central Illinois that shattered trees and encased entire houses. We had to chisel our way out of the front door. The way I remember it, we got hit at the tail end of November or the first week of December. It's hard to say. Either way, for the next month, we were in a purgatory of ice. Then, we got hit again in January. That one, I'm sure you remember. It wasn't exclusive to any one state. Most of North America felt that one. For a while, it seemed that winter wasn't going to end. Global warming had really come for us, huh? Of course, it did end. The ice melted and we went back to our usual lives, forgetting that more than 70 people were killed by that ice. Is 70 a lot? It feels like a lot. Either way, this story isn't about those 70 people. Maybe it should be. I know we've had some storms just as bad since then, and it never feels like the country is really prepared. I don't want to get into politics, though. I don't want to talk about how much our taxes go towards crisis spending, and I definitely don't want to debate the existence of global warming. I don't drink myself to sleep every night trying to forget that the ice caps are melting. I'm trying to forget what I saw. We had a few weeks to prepare, right? A few weeks when we all talked about the weatherman and doubted that his predictions of the record-setting low temperatures would come true. We doubted him, but we emptied the stores anyways. We all do a bit of panic shopping, don't we? We hear we might be stuck indoors, and suddenly, all we can think of is hoarding as many resources as we can. Stock up the cupboards, fill the fridge, stack the cans in the basement. It was right after Thanksgiving. I remember because I was looking in the fridge. 
trying to decide whether or not my leftovers would carry me through the storm that was coming. I decided to grab a few groceries in the middle of the night just to be safe. I didn't count on the main roads being closed. I didn't count on the detour keeping me out so late. I certainly didn't think the storm would arrive while I was behind the wheel. It did. I ended up parked on the side of the road. My hazard lights reflected in the falling snow and ice illuminating the area around me one beat at a time. Each time the light blinked on and unveiled the world around me, the road and the fields were covered by more freezing white. I was being buried. Luckily, by then I had grabbed my groceries. I zipped up my jacket and worked my way through a candy bar. It turns out stress eating can't save you from a blizzard. I started the car to run the heat and recharge the battery. As the engine hummed back to life, my hazard lights briefly stopped blinking. There was a pause in the rhythm. It was brief and only lasted for a single moment while the car fired back up. But in that brief moment, before the hazards and the headlights could shine, another light blinked back at me. I cut the engine immediately. I pressed the triangular button that toggled my emergency lights and I held my breath. Whatever blinked at me, it came from the sky. The helicopter? Not in that weather. I rubbed my eyes and took a deep breath, telling myself that stress was overwhelming me. All of the shadows from the storm had caught me by surprise. When I looked back through the windshield, the light blinked again. This time, it was closer. This time, I saw where it was coming from. Easily the diameter of a train car. It was floating above the road. It didn't move. It didn't make a sound. The wind and the snow and the ice didn't seem to touch it. The smooth black surface was unmarked by the winter. From my position on the road, I could only make out a single obstruction on its polished circular frame. There was a large indentation, also circular, facing my direction. It felt like I was looking at the hollow socket of a skull. It felt like there was an eye there, something watching me that I couldn't see. The light blinked again, shining from that indentation and blanketing my car. It swallowed the vehicle and blinded me. I felt the frame rumble and grabbed my steering wheel until my knuckles turned white. Something lurched underneath me like the car was being lifted from the ground. I swayed in the mean winter wind. And then I fell. The vehicle crashed back onto the pavement. It must have only risen an inch or two, but it was enough to shake me to my core. My head bounced when I looked up. The light and the object in the sky were gone. I didn't die out there. I didn't wind up one of those 70 people. I know that makes me lucky. But I have spent every day since wondering what that was. What did it want? Why did it stop to look at me? Was it satisfied with what it saw? So it dropped the car and spared my life. Or was it disappointed? So it cast me back into the storm and let Mother Nature decide my fate. Like I said, I don't believe in the supernatural. I need you to tell me what was natural about what I saw that night. Thanks for watching and let me know what you think of these stories in the comments below. Don't forget that you can listen to my episodes on any of your favorite podcasting platforms. I try to upload every single day on this channel and on Donovan Dread 2, where I release shorter content. Same great encounters, just a little bit shorter. Also, if you want to see crazy encounters captured on trail cams, then check out Dread Captures. It's part of the Dread Network, where we go over live footage of very strange encounters that are sent into the Facebook group or videos that are circulating on the web. Last but certainly not least, check out Lilith Dread. She releases the same great content daily on her channel. You'll find all of these links below. Thanks and take care.